Welcome to Newport in the winter. Got some snow finally. Uh, my name is Dave Pilati. If you haven't been to this lecture before, I'm honored to be your host for this evening. And I will give you just a few administrative comments before we get right into this fascinating discussion. Um, first off, I'd like to thank Fran from our base Family and Fleet Support Center who's here. She's a co-sponsor. Um, totally encourage you to stop by and see her on the way out. She's got some great materials. Thank you very much, Fran, for being here this evening. As part of this series, we continue to deliver our lectures in a fashion that's very similar to what Naval War College students get. In fact, this one, David, is probably identical to one of the lectures you give. And the same type of engagement with questions and answers is uh, not only desired, but it's encouraged. So you'll have a nice chunk of time at the end um, for asking questions. Please hold your questions until Dr. Cooper uh, offers up the time, please, just to keep things on track. Similar to previous lectures, this one will also be for attribution, so just keep that in mind as you ask questions. There is a videotape rolling in the back. Your face isn't on it, but your voice will be on it, just to keep that in mind. And also, please remember that Dr. Cooper is gonna express views tonight that are his and his alone. They don't necessarily reflect those of the Naval War College, the US Navy, or the Department of Defense. Now, for tonight's awesome lecture, we're very fortunate to have Professor David Cooper with us. He is currently the James V. Forrestal Professor of National Security Affairs here at the Naval War College. He just recently finished up tenure as the chair of the National Security Affairs Department for eight years. I think he's quite relieved to be teaching and researching again and not having to do some of the administration. Um, he's researched and published extensively on various topics related to nuclear disarmament and nonproliferation. Prior to becoming an academic, he served for nearly two decades in the Pentagon within the Office of the Secretary of Defense, including as the Director of Strategic Arms Control Policy and Director of Nonproliferation Policy. He holds a PhD in Political Science and International Relations from the Australian National University and is extremely well published, as you would imagine, having written numerous chapters, scholarly articles, and a book on nonproliferation of WMD, and he has another book in works right now. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Cooper. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna try to make this uh, a relatively quick overview. Um, I'm not necessarily good at not blathering, so I'm gonna try to discipline myself and move through it. Um, just to give everyone kind of on the same page uh, and background, and then I wanna try to leave as much time as possible uh, for your questions so we can get into more of a discussion um, about whatever piece of this topic uh, is of interest to you. And I will just reinforce that disclaimer. Uh, these views uh, and everything that I say are strictly my own. Um, and in some cases, uh, I will be saying things uh, that are relatively controversial, um, and I'll try to identify uh, the things I'm saying uh, that uh, others may uh, disagree with, uh, just to make that clear. So we'll throw that away. All right, let's start with just some basics, uh, some nuclear uh, weapons uh, 101. I mean, this whole topic, nuclear weapons, arms racing, that's so Cold War, right? I mean, this is, this is stuff from movies that you saw maybe uh, in black and white, Dr. Strangelove and, and uh, that sort of thing, fail safe. Um, this was a big deal in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, but who really cares about nuclear weapons anymore? And that really has been the story of the last quarter century. Uh, for 25 years, uh, we haven't really worried about nuclear weapons. They've still been there but the numbers have been coming down, and mostly what we've been worried about is not having new countries that we find particularly worrisome. North Korea, Iran, Iraq, Libya, um, getting nuclear weapons, because even a few nuclear weapons in the hands of those sorts of countries could be very worrying. But we haven't really worried about things like nuclear arms races um, for a very long time, um, for, for basically three decades. So, I put a question mark uh, at, uh, on the title of this, a new nuclear arms race. Uh, I'm gonna remove that question mark figuratively by the time we're done uh, and answer in the affirmative, but let's, let's walk through. So when we think of nuclear weapons, these are the images that inevitably we have at the back of our mind, the terrible images uh, of the attack on Hiroshima, uh, Nagasaki, 
uh, the only time that nuclear weapons have been used in warfare, um, and the terrible destruction uh, that we know uh, resulted from that. <clears throat> and so you look at these images, and it kind of conveys to you uh, the idea of, of just the horrific power of these types of weapons. And yet these images are incredibly misleading. This is not the result of nuclear weapons. This is an atomic attack. I'm not gonna get into the difference between fission and fusion and all sorts of technical things, but suffice to say that these nuclear weapons would now be considered very small, very crude, these atomic weapons. weapons. So let me give a little nomenclature. Um, kiloton versus megaton. You may have heard of that. That's how we measure the explosive power of a nuclear weapon. And so basically a kiloton is a measurement that simply means the explosive equivalent of a thousand tons of TNT. So the weapon that was dropped on Hiroshima was about a 15 kiloton weapon. What that means is that uh, that weapon had about 15,000 times the power of a ton of TNT. What's a megaton? A megaton is a million tons of TNT. So a kiloton is a thousand, a megaton is a million. So uh, I just want everyone to pause and kind of, sometimes you hear numbers, but let's, let's, let's scale our minds up between a thousand and a million. I mean, you know, a thousand, 10,000, a hundred thousand, a million. So that's how far away a megaton is from a kiloton. So the atomic bomb on Hiroshima was about 15 kilotons. The largest thermonuclear device ever tested was in the 1960s. It was the Soviet Sarbama test. That was a 50 megaton explosion. The weapon itself was designed as a 100 megaton weapon, but was only tested to 50 kilotons. So again, Hiroshima, 15 kilotons, kiloton thousand, megaton million, 50 megatons designed to 100 megatons. Now there's good news. Zarbama was basically a publicity stunt. Um, this weapon was never usable as a weapon of war. It was just too big. Um, it was never deployed. Uh, no weapon this size has ever been deployed. But what I want you to get your, your mind around, uh, if you see here, I'm gonna try not to step in front of the screen here because then you can't see, but if you come over here, it might be hard for you to see. This is Zarbama. These are US nuclear tests from the 1960s, and this is the mushroom cloud that came up from it. So this is Zarbama, this is the US thermonuclear test, and in this tiny circle, right in there, is blown up here, that's Hiroshima. So Zarbama, Hiroshima. So yes, we see the destructive images of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and we think that we understand what we're talking about. That is not in even an order of magnitude scale of what we're talking about. All right, so let's bring this forward to today. Today, the largest US warhead is just a bit over a megaton, about 1.2 megatons. So again, to do that comparison, uh, this is the mushroom cloud that that warhead would make. That's Mount Everest. That's the typical height of a commercial jetliner. And there's Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So in that sense, the good news is we're not dealing with Zarbama, but we are dealing with the megaton range versus the small kiloton range. Let's talk about what this means. Now let's look at 
a smallish Russian bomb in the half megaton range. This would be considered a standard Russian warhead. What you're seeing here is a map of Washington, D.C., and this is what it would look like if the Hiroshima bomb were dropped on the Pentagon. This is not the total lethality. This is only basically the fire blast. But these would be the people who would be killed instantly. This is a standard Russian warhead dropped on Washington, D.C. The difference, as you see, is it takes in the entirety of Washington, D.C., that one standard size warhead. And of course, again, this is just the blast uh, radius in terms of the firestorm. Uh, you would have radiation and, and far bigger effects. So again, just in terms of giving you a sense of scale of a Hiroshima size event versus uh, a single Russian standard size warhead on the nation's capital. Now, unfortunately, I gave you good news about Tsar Bama. Now I have some bad news. The bad news is there are unverified reports that Russia's new Canyon nuclear armed autonomous torpedo, which was unveiled to great fanfare by President Putin uh, as one of his doomsday mega weapons, is slotted to carry a 100 megaton warhead, twice as big as Sarbama. This is truly a doomsday uh, machine. Uh, these are unverified reports. Uh, some of them are based on leaked, accidentally leaked documents by the Russians. So we don't know if this is true or not. We don't know if this is you know, a, an attempt by the Russians uh, to say they have uh, something more powerful uh, in the works than they really have. Uh, however, uh, videos have been released of the actual torpedo, and it is essentially an autonomous submarine. Um, so it is perfectly plausible that a warhead of this size uh, could be uh, put on uh, such, uh, such a, uh, a, a device. Um, that autonomous torpedo uh, is said to travel at speeds of over 100 knots, uh, and therefore, uh, essentially, uh, any coastal city uh, in the United States uh, would be vulnerable uh, potentially uh, to that system. And Canyon is not the only new doomsday weapon that Russia is planning to deploy. And whereas we really don't know about that, among the others, they are much further along. Uh, they are beginning to deploy, and we have fairly high confidence in what we're looking at. So now, taking center stage, let me introduce the Satan II missile. Satan II is a road mobile, heavy missile of the sort we have not seen since the Cold War. The Satan II missile carries enough multiple independently targetable re-entry warheads that according to the Russians, a single Satan II missile deploying its warheads would be capable of utterly destroying the state of Texas in its entirety. So a single missile with all of those warheads that it carries could kill Texas in its entirety. All right, so that's Nuclear Weapons 101. Are we all with me? Sun's still shining outside. Let's, let's take a deep breath. Uh, but this is important context to understand uh, what, we're, uh, what we're talking about. How big a problem is this? Why is it happening? Um, and what are we doing about it? Let me, let me turn to that. That's not going to help. Oh, come on, a little humor here. <laughs> Unfortunately, that isn't going to help. Uh, this is not a problem where local solutions are going to work. Um, this is a global problem, if you will, or becoming a global problem. So let me get into where we've been in recent years, where we are, and where we may be going. It's hard to believe it was only a decade ago, literally a decade ago next month, that President Barack Obama heralded in a wave of optimism that nuclear weapons were on the way off the stage of humanity. Uh, he announced the US was supporting uh, an initiative 
to make a world free of nuclear weapons. We would be taking steps. We'd move towards it. It would combine further reductions with the Russians, bringing other nuclear powers into the process, and stopping countries like Iran or North Korea um, from getting those weapons. And there was a tremendous amount uh, of optimism. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, President Obama uh, essentially won a Nobel Peace Prize um, for this initiative. Ten years is a long time. What are the concerns? Well, the concern for a long time hasn't really been on the existing nuclear powers. It's been on the idea of nuclear proliferation. And the big fear has been nuclear tipping points or nuclear spirals. What does that mean? That means that if enough new countries sort of violate the non-proliferation treaty that says no one who doesn't already have nuclear weapons can get them, at a certain point, other countries are going to come in, and the tipping point is a tipping point where the NPT treaty just sort of unravels very quickly. Or you have the idea of proliferation spirals, where it's in a particular region where you have a spiral of one country in the region gets it, and then it creates a regional dynamic. And, and this has been a concern for a long time. Now, the good news is, well, let me, let me take you back and show you how long it's been a concern. I actually have a musical interlude for you, which I bet you weren't expecting uh, at, uh, at this conversation. So back in the 50s and 60s, there was a guy named Tom Lehrer. And he was basically the late night um, satirist uh, of his day. Uh, and he did a song right after the Chinese exploded their first nuclear weapon and became the fifth country to acquire nuclear weapons. If we can roll the tape, let's listen to Tom Lehrer's song. <laughs> All right. Uh, a few weeks ago, the American press reported that China had exploded a nuclear bomb. Now, this was a great leap forward for China, of course, but it was an even greater leap forward for the American press because for the first time they called it China instead of Red China. For 18 years they've been hoping it would just go away. Uh, and for the first time they called it a bomb instead of a device. <laughs> so, with China possessing the bomb, it makes us wonder who's next. We got the bomb, and that was good, cause we love peace and motherhood. Then Russia got the bomb, but that's okay, cause the balance of powers maintained that way. Who's next? France got the bomb, but don't you grieve, cause they're on our side, I believe. China got the bomb, but have no fears, they can't wipe us out for at least five years. Who's next? Then Indonesia claimed that they were going to get one any day. South Africa wants two, that's right. One for the black and one for the white. Who's next? Egypt's gonna get one too, just to use on you know who. So Israel's getting tense, wants one in self. Defense. The Lord is our shepherd, says the psalm, but just in case, we better get a bomb. <laughs> Who's the next? Oh, Luxembourg is next to go, and who knows, maybe Monaco. We'll try to stay serene and calm when Alabama gets the bomb. Who's next? Who's next? Who's next? Who's next? And indeed, the predictions at that time were that within a decade or so, probably 20 or even 25 countries uh, would have acquired nuclear weapons. And indeed, many countries uh, were pursuing them uh, very actively. There we go. So the good news is that didn't happen. We have had nuclear proliferation, but it's been very limited. We have Israel. 
We have Pakistan and India. We have North Korea. We believe we have still a problem with Iran, but that is debatable. But the fact of the matter is that we have not had that sort of highly proliferated world that people were worried about. We took steps. We imposed with the Soviets the non-proliferation treaty and basically made clear to the rest of the world that this was something everyone needed to get on board with. And we've had a pretty good run at enforcing that non-proliferation treaty. <clears throat> so in that sense, that really is the first piece of good news and, and perhaps a cause for optimism. A second cause for optimism. There are remarkably less nuclear weapons in the world now than there used to be. At the height of the Cold War, the peak inventory globally was at about 70,000 nuclear warheads. 70,000 nuclear warheads. I'm not going to go back to megatons and kilotons, but that's 70,000 individual nuclear warheads. Today, it's estimated that we're down to under 15,000. Now, by any measure, that is a remarkable reduction in the overall number of nuclear weapons. So that is another potential cause for optimism. Now, it's not going to surprise you. I've laid out the case for optimism. Um, I think that there is more reason to be concerned and pessimistic than there is to be optimistic. In terms of proliferation, we've been worried about nuclear tipping points, and we've been remarkably successful at avoiding them. However, unless we actually solve this North Korea situation, and despite the wave of diplomacy that we've seen, I and most of the experts in the field are skeptical. Uh, likewise, Iran, uh, we are keeping the lid on the Iran nuclear deal for the moment. Um, whether that is a permanent solution is, uh, shall we say, debatable, and I would say it's a dubious proposition. If we have a situation where Iran gets a nuclear weapon, the Saudis have essentially declared that they will get a nuclear weapon too. The Saudis have begun what's called a hedging strategy. Uh, the most oil-rich country in the world has decided it needs nuclear power. Um, the Saudis also have very close relations with Pakistan. Um, so the Saudis probably could get a nuclear weapon if they wanted to. Iran, uh, I'm sorry, Israel has, a, has nuclear weapons. However, they have a policy of ambiguity. They could step out of the closet, declare that indeed they do have nuclear weapons, reveal they have a robust uh, program, uh, take other steps. And indeed, if that happens, there's a possibility that other countries, such as Turkey or even Egypt, might feel compelled in a regional nuclear arms racing spiral to jump in. By the same token, if North Korea continues along its path. If China, and I'll talk about China in a moment, continues to grow its own nuclear arsenal, then it's quite possible that Japan and possibly even South Korea or other countries in the region could follow suit. So even though we have not had a case of rapid proliferation um, over the decades, it is not inconceivable uh, that in at least one region that you could have a rapid proliferation spiral. It's also not inconceivable that if it happens in one region that it will spill over. That if the NPT is seen to be basically crumbling, that people aren't going to wait for it to crumble in their region. So that, I think, is a cause of pessimism. Ironically, I don't think that's anything near the worst of our problems. Whereas for the last 30 years, we have thought about non-proliferation as the key challenge of nuclear weapons. I don't think that is the key challenge in the decades to come. In the decades to come, I think the key challenge is a return of great power nuclear competition, otherwise known as arms racing. At this stage, we are seeing a situation where all of the major nuclear powers, for the first time in decades, are undertaking massive modernization of their nuclear weapons programs. Modernization sounds not so bad. Modernization, you know, that's kind of when you traded your, you know, your VHS player for the 
DVD player and then you went to the streaming service, that's modernization. These modernizations, though, are not modernizations in the sense of replacing one kind with a slightly better, newer, and longer lasting kind. We are seeing a move into modernization that features entirely new types of systems, such as uh, that heavily MERV, heavy ICBM, such as that nuclear torpedo, such as, I believe, more significant within anything, what's called hypersonic maneuverable glide vehicles, which are going to, I think, have a more profound impact than the ICBM, the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, did when it was introduced in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Um, it's going to require us to completely, basically our missile defense uh, has, will be quickly rendered obsolete, and then we will either need to uh, reconceive our missile defense into something much more ambitious, which those who we are defending against will find much more threatening, um, which could, again, trigger what we call action-reaction cycles. And in fact, the politics are there. What I've described is a technical arms race, a technology-driven arms race, but this is part of a larger transition in the international system. Uh, the US national security strategy has said we're returning. We had a bipolar system where it was the US, the Soviets, and the Cold War. Then we had what's called a unipolar system where the US was sort of the unchallenged lone superpower. The national security strategy says we're returning to an era of multipolar, meaning various great powers, all competing with one another. Well, all of those great powers are nuclear powers. And all of those nuclear powers are engaging in an expansion and in some cases, potentially a dramatic expansion of their nuclear weapons programs. And in one case, that of Russia, Russia has adopted an overt doctrine of nuclear coercion and belligerency. So I'll just read this, because I think it bears reading. This was uh, in uh, his address to the Federation Parliament. President Vladimir Putin said, with the new system, there is no limitation, he was talking about one of those doomsday weapons. There is no limitation. It can attack any target through the North Pole or via the South Pole. No missile defense system will be able to withstand it. That's a statement of technology. Now there's the political statement. We made no secret of our plans. We spoke openly of what we wanted to do. They, us, they kept ignoring us. Nobody listened to us, so now, so listen to us now. This is an open statement of nuclear belligerency. Now again, who knows what the purpose of that is? Who knows where that's going? However, it's something we certainly need to pay attention to. And in fact, President Trump is reported to have responded immediately afterwards, if you want to have an arms race, we can do that, but I'll win. So it's not just that there are the technical manifestations of return of nuclear arms racing. There are the overt political maneuverings associated with great power rivalry and a nuclear arms race. And then there's China. China is the only one of the five nuclear weapon states allowed to have nuclear weapons under the NPT that has been growing its nuclear force. We and the Russians and the Brits and the French have spent the last three decades reducing our forces. That's how come we went from 70,000 nuclear weapons in the world down to under 15,000. The Chinese, though, have been growing and modernizing their force. Now, the thing is, no one really worried about that much because, one, their force was so much smaller than ours, and two, we didn't see China as a real strategic enemy. Now that we're moving into where that's a question, China is developing a full-scope nuclear force, a triad, as we call it. They're developing a new stealth long-range bomber um, to deliver strategic nuclear weapons. They are, delivering, they are developing a new class uh, of uh, 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 ballistic missile submarine, uh, and they are developing uh, a new class of heavy MIRV ICBMs, their own version of that Satan II. By the way, we don't have any heavy MIRV ICBMs. We don't have any road mobile ICBMs. 
Um, so this is something that is a concern. Now that said, China still has a relatively small nuclear force, we think. But it's growing, and we don't know. What are these funny little blobs? This is what's called the Underground Great Wall. The Chinese nuclear weapons program has dug thousands of miles of tunnels. And we don't really know what's in them. We do know China has enough fissile material to have produced far more nuclear weapons than the hundreds that we think they have. Uh, there have been Russian analysts who have suggested that the Chinese actually have many more nuclear weapons than they're claiming, uh, possibly uh, as many as the US uh, and, uh, and the Russians. Uh, that is not a widely held view. Uh, it's a very debated point. Uh, one side of the debate says, well, the whole point of having a nuclear deterrent is you know, to let people know they better not mess with you. There's no point in having a nuclear deterrent if you hide it. As a matter of fact, one of the great lines from Dr. Strangelove, if anyone has seen that movie from the 60s, is basically Dr. Strangelove says, but there's no point in having a doomsday machine if you didn't tell anyone you have a doomsday machine. On the other hand, there are plausible reasons why China may be hiding this for the moment um, for a big reveal at some point in the future. We just don't know, and I don't want to speculate. That said, what we do know is China has been building up and is continuing to build up. So if we look here, here's at the unclassified level where we think the nuclear weapons are. We and the Russians are just a few hundred less than when this chart was made because we've continued doing reductions under New START. Everyone else is just a little higher than this is about two years old because they've continued to build uh, nuclear weapons. And again, I highlight the estimates of China are about 270, uh, but some estimates go up to as, as much as 12 or 1400. Um, it's just, uh, it, we, we don't know, and China has not talked to us uh, about that. So let me get to the last point before I, I finish up, and that is this idea of what I would call trans-regional or multipolar nuclear arms racing. only nuclear arms race in history was a bipolar nuclear arms race, the US and the Soviets during the Cold War. And a bipolar arms race is actually a relatively stable situation. They tit, you tat, but everyone is kind of looking, what do they have, what do we have, and no one wants to fall behind, and everyone's sort of balancing. And that can lead to these action-reaction cycles. They get this, so we feel we need that, vice versa, and that's how we got up to 70,000 nuclear warheads. But it was still a pretty stable system. And the idea of deterrence, and this idea we had of assured destruction, that as long as the other side knew that whatever they did, they would be destroyed in the end in any case. That, you could take out three quarters of our nuclear weapons in a first strike, doesn't matter. One quarter of our nuclear weapons were still enough to wipe you off the face of the earth, that that would be stable. And we were arms racing, but we were arms racing against each other. The problem now is we have a multipolar situation. So those action-reaction cycles get a lot trickier. Let me give you some ideas of what I'm talking about. Pakistan is a nuclear rival of India. India is a nuclear rival of Pakistan. India is also a nuclear rival of China, and vice versa. Pakistan is arms racing against India, but India is arms racing against China. What does that mean? That means as Pakistan does things and provokes India to do other things, China gets nervous. The US is a nuclear rival of China. The US is a nuclear rival of Russia. Russia and China are nuclear rivals. So how does action-reaction work? Well, let's take 
an example ripped from the headlines, the INF Treaty. President Putin told us more than a decade ago, I can't stay in the INF Treaty. Why? INF Treaty is intermediate range systems. Well, US INF can't hit Russia. The vast majority of Chinese nuclear weapons are on intermediate range systems. China's not in the INF Treaty. The reason Russia was cheating on the INF Treaty was basically because they couldn't not respond to China, and China wasn't in the INF Treaty. Work this all out. So for example, we are doing things to improve missile defenses with Japan because of North Korea. Japan's freaking out about North Korea. Japan's openly talking in their society about maybe we need nuclear weapons of our own at some point. We don't want that. We're like, no, 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 calm down. We're giving Japan missile defense and saying, okay, we're going to give you missile defense. The North Koreans, sure, they have nuclear weapons, but we can handle that. But guess what happens when we're giving Japan missile defense and when we're moving missile defenses into South Korea? Who freaks out? China freaks out. Because China's saying, well, wait, if you have missile defenses, those could be used against us too. So when you look at Russian and China developing hypersonic glide vehicles, as I talked about, they're doing that because they're afraid our missile defenses are going to threaten their retaliatory capability. So they feel they need to do something. The problem is hypersonic is going to require us to take missile defenses to the next level, meaning literally the next level, outer space. You can only defend against hypersonics with the space-based missile defense system, which will freak Russia and China out all the more. Action, reaction cycles. The problem is this time, what some pair does because of each other will freak out other people who will have to respond to it because you do not have a nice, stable US, Soviet, hey, we're arms racing, what did you do, what do I do? It's this multipolar situation with multiple nuclear rivals. Indeed. It's even been suggested that the US may come to the point where not only do we not try to convince Japan to get nuclear weapons, but that we're going to want Japan, that we're going to want South Korea, that we're going to want Germany, that we're going to want Australia to have nuclear weapons. Well, because they're on our side, I believe, in the words of Tom Lyra. Now, this is not a world that's inevitable, and this is not a world that is even necessarily probable. It depends on a lot of different factors, mostly political factors, and whether the US, China, Russia, India really do start developing great power competition or whether we can figure out a way to settle that down. The weapons aren't going to cause any of this. The weapons aren't the cause. But the weapons are going to be a very serious symptom. I'll end on a downer of a note. I I know you probably think I've already been on a downer of a note. The problem is, even though this isn't inevitable, it's by no means implausible. And I'm not even sure it's improbable. And yet, we really don't know how this is going to work. There has never been a multipolar world in the nuclear age. The two most stable international systems, unipolar and bipolar, are the only ones we've ever known in the nuclear age. We are now moving into a more traditional international system, which is always thought to be less stable, and that's multipolar competition. And so unfortunately, the tools that we have right now are simply not up to the task. So most of them have ceased to exist. Um, one of my controversial statements last year was that by the time I gave this talk again this year, I thought the INF Treaty would be toast. But I said, now, hey, that's controversial. Many people don't agree with me. Unfortunately, uh, well, the INF Treaty is toast. That basically leaves the New START Treaty as the last piece of the bilateral US-Russian architecture. It expires in 2021. And I think the chances of it being extended are 50-50 at best. Even if we do expend, extend it, well, guess who's not a part of it? China, India. 
So I don't think that's really likely. The last piece of news and the worst piece of news is that the newest effort to deal with this, I would characterize as dangerously unserious. The response has been to basically pursue a global ban on nuclear weapons that no nuclear weapon state or close ally of a nuclear weapon state has supported or frankly will support. Um, this is the sort of feel good thing that you do when you're not doing anything serious. And the problem with that is I may not be right that this is our dangerous nuclear future, but it's plausible enough we should be thinking seriously about what serious things we can do to manage and mitigate that situation. And at this point, we're not. We're not at all. And so with that, and almost exactly on time to leave a half hour for questions, let me turn to questions and uh, ask any part of this uh, please, let's, uh, let's turn this into a conversation. Good evening. Thanks for that lecture. A question, the, the principles of multi, um, mutual assured destruction, will that still apply in this multipolar uh, nuclear arms race you were describing? Yes. So one of the great debates is how automatic and stable is deterrence. So now I'm going to, sorry. The War College, um, I'm an academic, so I'm going to get a little academic on you. Um, that kind of depends on your theory of the matter. So we have some uh, what are called neo-realists who uh, have argued, uh, such as uh, the late uh, Ken Waltz and others, that nuclear weapons create an automatic deterrent situation. That even just a few nuclear weapons no one's going to mess with anyone that has even a few nuclear weapons. And so Waltz created a great controversy by saying, we're getting this all wrong. Let's not fight proliferation. Let's encourage it. If nuclear weapons made the world unsafe for a US-Soviet war, then let's make the world unsafe for an Indian-Pakistani war or any other war. Um, that's a minority view. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the the majority view goes something like this. Asymmetric multipolar deterrence becomes incredibly complex. So just kind of as a mathematical proposition and assuming that no spirals or turning points happen and it's just the countries we have today, if you look at who's rivals and whatnot, you've got something like 20 something nuclear relationships just today. And if this world comes to pass, we probably will have new entrants. So the answer to the question becomes, how automatic is deterrence and how much can we rely on it? And unfortunately, this is where the historians have sort of gotten us all a little worried. Because we came out of the Cold War feeling pretty good about ourselves. It's like, hey, look at that. You know, we had this like multi-generational arms race and struggle, ideological struggle, and it all ended without a war. That must be because that deterrence worked. The problem is the historians tell us that, well, it did work most of the time, and then a few times we got really, really lucky. And the problem is that in a nuclear world, it needs to work every time, all the time, forever. Whoever the leader is, whatever the disputes and the various combinations are, and there's a lot of feeling that, wow, that, you know, yes, deterrence clearly is a powerful thing. It clearly matters a lot, but at a minimum, the argument is, it doesn't happen automatically. At a minimum, we need to set up a system where we can manage deterrence. Now, the confidence in deterrence has become so questioned on both, if you will, from the hawks and the doves, that both on the left and the right, if you will, the hawks and the doves, for at least the last decade, if not more, 
The argument has been, as this history has come out, we can't rely on this. We need, uh, this is just, you know, we are, we are playing, if you'll forgive the pun, Russian roulette, and at some point, it's not gonna work out, but you know, one nuclear holocaust will ruin everyone's day. So they've argued we need an actual permanent solution. And the one side has said there's only one permanent solution, the total abolition of nuclear weapons. The only solution, we can't rely on determinants, we need to get rid of all nuclear weapons. And the other side, that was the doves, by the way, the hawks have said, well, sure, that would be great. We'd be all for it, but you're naive. You're out to lunch. It's not going to happen. It's not practical to think that you're going to get all these countries to give up their nuclear weapons. So the hawks say, but therefore, we need a different solution. We need to go into missile defense all out. We need to solve the problem by basically making the offense no match for the defense. At which point, well, now we don't need to rely on assured destruction. We just go back to kind of the Reagan idea of, of a shield. And the doves say, well, we'd love that. That would be great, but you're naive. You're out to lunch. That's not practical. You can't actually do it. And the sort of depressing proposition I will throw out to you is what if they're both right? And if they're both right, and it would be great if one or the other could be proved right, because then we solve this problem and we come out from the nuclear shadow. That would be wonderful. But if they're both right, then we need to sort of muddle and manage our way through it. And that's a much tougher proposition. So everyone can hear. I sure hope so, because that's what my book that I'm writing right now is about, to say that's kind of where we need to go. Um, and, and is the IEA the right organization to do that? No. Okay. No, and, and here's why. I mean, the, the bottom line is, so again, back to the hawks and the doves, the nuclear abolition versus the, you know, full up Star Wars uh, sort of uh, missile defense. Both sides say that not only are you naive, it's not gonna work, but both sides say you're worse than naive because in trying to get there, you create a dangerous situation. So the hawks to the disarmers. The problem is as you come down and you come down, there'll be a point where you'll get to such a low amount of nuclear weapons that cheating becomes really viable. I mean, suddenly, if everyone's down to having 100 nuclear weapons, someone with 500 nuclear weapons where they hid 400 of them in a tunnel suddenly becomes the dominant nuclear power and can kind of pop up and say, aha. As a matter of fact, it creates what's called deterrence instability. If I only have 100 nuclear weapons, well, guess what? It's not crazy to think I can take those all out in a first strike and then win the war. So the hawks say, not only isn't it feasible, it's downright dangerous. And the doves turn around and say to the hawks, well, the same is true of missile defense. Because even if you could build that missile defense that we don't think you could build, even if you can, you're not going to get it like that. And at a certain point where you're building it, if others realize, uh-oh, they're going to build it, well, now you're about to make their nuclear weapons obsolete. What does that suggest they do? 
Well, that's going to put them in a situation where they need to use them or lose them. Again, what if they're both right? The answer to your question that middle way, that's kind of what we did in the Cold War. Um, arms control was never a solution. It was trying to sort of manage these things and create a process and figure out what was going to create instability and try to just sort of, as a matter of fact, arms control is one of the most hated ideas by both the hawks and the doves. The hawks hate it because it's constraining things. And if you're going to be in it, you got to be in it to win it. The only solution is kind of nuclear superiority plus defense. And the doves hate it because you're basically saying, yeah, we're living with nuclear weapons. We don't think we're going to get rid of them. You know, we're, we're, we're sort of managing around the edges. Um, now, it was the organizing principle that everyone could kind of get behind in the Cold War. To get to your question, the answer is none of those Cold War tools work because the whole Cold War structure is there's two countries, so we're going to do the arms control between us, and then there's everybody else, and we're going to do non-proliferation for them, and that's the IEA's job. Go look out for those other people, and then we're doing an arms race. Well, it's either bilateral or it's everybody. What we're going to need here is to reinvent arms control, which is, again, the topic of the book I'm writing, to be a multipolar approach to arms control, or what in the business we call a plurilateral plurilateral approach. So not 60 or 70 or 100 or whatever countries, but we are going to need, at a minimum, the US, Russia, and China. And that's not really the minimum, because China's not going to sign up to this if India is not brought in at some point. And Russia is not going to sign up for it unless France and Britain are brought in at some point. And so at a minimum, we're going to need India, France, and Britain at some point, but the core Russia, the US, and China. But even that gets complicated, because India is not going to be able to do this unless someone takes care of Pakistan for them. That's what I was saying. I don't know the answer. Everyone says, well, what's the, show me the magic treaty that does this. We, I believe, are in a situation very similar to the situation we were in in basically 1958. Um, things are now changing, and we haven't even gotten our heads around what this all means. And really, all I'm trying to do in giving these lectures now and again and in writing the book I'm writing is to say, we need to start thinking about this stuff again. And we need to start realizing that the old tools that we've had that have worked so well are probably not up to the new environment we're heading into and that we don't know how that's going to work in the new environment. But ban treaties and or missile defense are at a minimum probably not going to be easy to do. And uh, in reality, I don't think in our current political environment or the foreseeable political environment, you're going to have support for either of those kind of maximalist solutions. So I think we're going to be muddling through. But no, the IAEA, uh, China, if, if, if we're getting to serious great power rivalry, no one wants the IEA involved. That's going to have to be between the actual nuclear rival. Uh, when we speak about the expert level, such as yourself, and we speak about the heads of state, top leaders in the countries that do possess these weapons, can you think, you know, going back to Hiroshima, can you quantify at all the um, the degree of conviction of top leaders to move in either direction and what has inhibited having this kind of um, instability or stability? Well, I, I think one of the inhibitors is that nuclear weapons are actually a uh, very useful tool of national power from a leader's perspective. Uh, you know, it's, it's very easy for us to think, well, you know, what's my big concern? My big concern is that the world doesn't suddenly go crispy um, and, and that's all she wrote. But from an international politics point of view, uh, it's not just that nuclear weapons uh, 
deter other nuclear weapons. To be honest, that's the easy part. Why Russia is all in on nuclear weapons, and the reason they're all in on nuclear weapons is their conventional forces are incapable of defending Russia against either NATO or China, and certainly on a two-front war. Russia is using nuclear weapons to make up for the fact that they have a conventional deficiency. And nuclear weapons are actually pretty cheap in terms of the bang for the buck you get. The irony is it's the exact opposite situation. So in the Cold War, Russia was constantly calling for a no first use pledge. That no, every country will say we will not be the first one to use nuclear weapons. And it's been, it was the United States that said, no, we're not gonna say that because our concern isn't that we're gonna invade you, our concern is you're gonna invade us, that you're gonna have more powerful conventional forces and you need to know that yes, if you do that, we will use nuclear weapons and I need to actually convince you of that. And this gets to now, I, I've stayed away from um, deterrence logic, uh, but there's a whole logic of credibility. Uh, Charles de Gaulle famously said France needed its own nuclear weapons because he could not rely that a president of the United States would sacrifice New York to save Paris. A Chinese general in 1995 very much echoed that when he said, well, the US needs to remember, is it really willing to sacrifice Los Angeles to save Taipei? So a big part of what nuclear weapons are about are preventing, um, are, are compensating for conventional weakness and preventing nuclear coercion. Because Russia now has thousands more small tactical battlefield nuclear weapons than we have. And President Putin has started reminding us of that. So it's not just that nuclear weapons are to stop other nuclear weapons. President Putin, in his mind, either believes or wants us to believe he believes. And this is the problem with deterrence. It's all about perceptions. So it's really all just a mind game thing. So he either believes, which would be very scary, or he wants us to believe he believes that he now has a battlefield advantage. And so the Russians have adopted a doctrine of escalate to de-escalate. And what that means is we will start using tactical nuclear weapons the minute we think we're losing, even if it was us who started it. So it gets, it gets very strange very quickly in this world of, of nuclear strategy and nuclear doctrine, but the fact of the matter is um, the narrative that we had tried to convey for decades was nuclear weapons are really only good to stop other people from using nuclear weapons against you. They're not really very good for much, and that's why we're getting rid of them and you should not get them. And the problem we have now is we're not getting rid of them anymore. We're recapitalizing. We're the last to start recapitalizing. Um, but the Chinese are recapitalizing. The Russians are recapitalizing. The Indians are recapitalizing. By the way, all the criticism of our missile defense, the Chinese have a big missile defense program. The Russians have a big missile defense program. The Indians have a big missile defense program. Um, so the problem is these are actually, from a national point of view, very useful weapons, and the only great powers that don't have or think they need nuclear weapons, for all intents and purposes today, are Japan and Germany. And, and that's because we've told them that's OK. You basically can have ours if you need them. We have your back. And a big question in all this is how long they will continue um, to believe that. Now, that's actually some leverage we have. There's nothing that scares Russia more. Nothing on the planet than Germany with nuclear weapons. Germans scare Russians in a way that no one else does for very recent historical reasons. And the exact same is true when it comes to China and Japan. There is nothing that would scare China or bother China more in the world 
than Japan armed with nuclear weapons. So in a weird way, that's kind of leverage for us. I mean, one of the things we have to say, hey, we better not let this all spin out of control because those folks are kind of happy now, but if things spin out of control, you know, Sorry, I know that's, and, and again, believe it or not, I'm trying to keep this as un-Dr. Strange lovey as I can without it sounding too crazy. Uh, thank you for the lecture. Um, I think one of the uh, responses to, uh, in your response to this last question, um, <clears throat> one of the essential elements of that response was that for a long time, a lot of these countries saw the United States pursue a heavily militarized foreign policy. And so since they have a conventional imbalance, they saw nuclear weapons uh, as defense against that policy, or they pursued nuclear weapons to provide them with defense against American policy. So um, my question speaks to really this essential element of uh, the conundrum, which is trust. Um, and central to the whole idea about arms control is verification regimes. So my question really is, will there ever be a time, uh, whether it's plural, pluralistic uh, deterrence or arms control agreements, where the international environment we live in will have enough trust uh, through verification regimes to actually achieve any progress down this recommended path, or whether there will just be a continuation of burying them in the holes in the ground whether they're in China or in North Dakota or wherever they are, while we continue to write paper that doesn't have the trust. My answer, and this is now sort of double super duper, um, just my own view uh, and certainly controversial. My, my feeling is that we are not going to have anything dramatic, certainly in terms of reductions and probably even in terms of caps or bans on new technology until the shape and contours of whatever this new international system we're moving into becomes more obvious. Because the problem is in the face of sort of a transitional international system where no one quite knows what's going to happen, that's where trust is the hardest because everybody is then inclined to, well, let's just, you know, let's, let's hedge our bets here. Um, once that system settles down and if we make it through, I mean, we all think of arms control and we think about reductions and we think about the INF Treaty and we think about the START Treaty and the new START Treaty. All of that happened basically at the very end of the 1980s and the beginning of the 1990s when basically the Soviet Union fell apart. For the decades before that, we had very modest treaties, the SALT Treaty. Uh, basically, the SALT Treaty went into force, and that's when we kept growing to the 70,000. Well, what the SALT Treaty did do is give us a process to talk, helped us understand each other's deterrence theories and logic, and helped us actually head off some things that everyone understood would be the most destabilizing. So I I'm, you know, if, if, if anything, um, if we could get probably not a ban, but at least a cap on hypersonic delivery vehicles, you know, okay, everybody gets 50. That's not enough for a first strike or maybe even 100. But, you know, if, 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 if we don't have something like that, we're, we're probably back to, uh, I mean, this is going to be the new delivery vehicle that makes everything else obsolete. So we're gonna need as many as they have and that's, that's how that all works. So yes, I think there might be a, a scope for that, but not in the way we think of it, start treaties and whatnot. I mean, the first thing, the Chinese won't talk to us. The, the Chinese uh, position on engaging in any sort of arms control or even transparency discussions goes something like this. Well, you're so big, meaning we and the Russians, and we're so tiny. How tiny? Mm, we won't tell you, but tiny. Compared to you, trust us. What's in all those tunnels? We don't wanna talk about that, just trust us. You're so big and we're so tiny, you keep cutting and you keep coming down 
And when you've come down enough that you're near us, we'll tell you, and then we can all talk. That's been the Chinese position for basically about the last 20 years. The Russian position on tactical nuclear weapons, where they have an overwhelming, an overwhelming majority, is where we should only talk about strategic nuclear weapons, where, by the way, we have an advantage. And we say, yeah, but we're worried about those tactical too, so we'd like to do both. And in the 2002 Moscow Treaty, and then in the 2010 uh, New Start Treaty, we did a Charlie Brown and the football twice, where both times the Russians said, well, tell you what, let's do the strategic treaty now, and then we'll do the tactical after. And both times, guess what happened? We did the strategic treaty now, and we said, okay, we're ready for the tactical, and they're like, eh, let's think about that a little more, because they have an advantage over us. So they haven't been willing to negotiate with us on that. So this is just all a long-winded way of saying, we need to get back to the basics of just sitting down and having a process where we're all admitting that we're gonna talk about what we're doing, why we think we're doing it, um, and where the dangers might be and where we can all live with, well, maybe if we all don't do that. Um, and we're nowhere near having that process. So I mean, I guess my answer is something along the lines of uh, think modestly, because right now we're, we're sort of nowhere. So we, we're gonna have to start, and we didn't start with INF and start. We, we started with very modest things and worked forward and essentially just tried to manage the problem till the political situation changed. And, and that's probably what we're heading into. So again, right now with, uh, with a transition in the international system, um, is China gonna be our peer rival? Are we going to be adversaries? Is there a new Cold War? Are we containing them? Is Russia really gonna ally with China, its historic enemy, or might, over time, Russia realize that its interests are more in the West? I'm talking, looking out over a decade, two decades, three decades, no one knows the answer to those things. Many academics are you know, having a field day writing books, talking about where all this might go, but we don't know. Until that settles down, I don't see a big comprehensive solution to this. I think it's more just a problem we're going to need to manage. Evening, sir. Uh, thank you for coming into, uh, well, I guess you work here, so you, we're coming to see you lecture, so. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, my question is, uh, what do you see as the main challenge for the United States when dealing with Russia and China, states that don't have democratic forms of government? where they can kind of plan 30 years in the future where we kind of flip it back and forth every four or eight years. So how do we combat that kind of, uh, how they have one vision for doing things? So I mean, that's always been a challenge. I mean, you know, democracies are not meant for efficient continuity uh, on foreign policy or anything else. Um, we are in a particularly uh, fraught political period now. We've, we've been in a political period for at least a decade where um, bipartisan consensus uh, has been rare. Uh, so you know, we're in a particularly challenging uh, moment uh, in terms of the effectiveness of our democracy to sort of uh, do that sort of things. But that's just, that's how it is, uh, and to be honest, uh, the other systems have uh, challenges too. Uh, you have, uh, uh, you know, Russian generals saying that their big concern is essentially uh, color revolutions being fomented by the United States, meaning their own people might rise up. We have China uh, that has a model that kind of has to have economic growth. Um, it's like a shark that dies if it stops swimming. Uh, so I mean, all of these countries have their challenges. Uh, I think the issue is uh, how do you not get caught up in sort of the drama of right now and think, as we say here at the War College, a bit more strategically um, and, and kind of look at the structural issues uh, and figure out how to work through that. 
Uh, and I think it's, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, we're certainly uh, going to need either our alliance system to be strengthened and to go back to much more what it was like during the Cold War, or if we're not going to desire allies, then we're going to need to figure out what that means and what the alternative system is. Right now, we have an alliance system that we're expressing ambiguity about, ambivalence about, uh, and that's worrying to me, uh, if only because either we need, if that's the system we're going with, then we need to be doing everything we can to shore it up, and if we've decided that's not the system, then we better be figuring out what's going to replace it. So yeah, I mean, there, we, we, we've got some challenges. Uh, but the others, you know, the Chinese have challenges, the Russians have lots of challenges. I mean, Russia, Russia's not the big threat we're facing if we get through the next 20 years. Uh, Russia is aging, they're in demographic decline, uh, they have a, uh, essentially an extraction economy, uh, they do not have uh, an economy that's sort of uh, innovating uh, and, and whatnot. So I mean, Russia, you know, Russia's facing, Russia right now, I mean, President Putin is, is sort of realizing that this is, you know, this is the moment where they have maximum uh, residual um, but Russia, in the end, is going to need to decide to be a junior partner of China or to sort of take a balancing and be kind of more neutral between China and the West or to join the West. I mean, you know, Russia is not going to be able to play in this game um, looking out 20 or 30 years unless something very drastic changes. And there's real questions about China. So, you know, I, again, pontificating on where all this goes. I, I don't know, I'm just focusing on the fact that um, while everyone is heavily armed and arming even more with nuclear weapons, that's a piece of this puzzle we need to keep our eye on, because again, um, that's one that if we get even a little wrong, uh, it goes very wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join me in thanking Dr. Cooper for Thank you. So a, a couple of admin notes. Um, I see Dr. Terry Rorick sitting here. Uh, you'll see him in maybe six weeks, Terry, is that right? Yeah, so if you want to learn about the uh, denuclearization of North Korea, so dive in just to one country, Terry will be with us. Um, we've got quite the lineup coming up where... I just have to say, Terry, that we can start. So, you know, anything I've said, Terry, in terms of specifically looking at the Korean problem, uh, Terry Rorig is a national asset. He may be uh, one of the smartest people uh, in this area in the country. So just needed to say that. And, and I'll add that, uh, that I'm standing between two national assets, as you probably got from the lecture tonight. So as you look at that lineup there, there's a lot of really cool topics coming up. And then surprise, surprise, Admiral Harley challenged me to get uh, Mr. Jim Stockdale, the son of the legendary Admiral James Stockdale, to come, and I think we're going to squeeze him in on May 14th, but I will get that date out via email and social media. That is quite the moving and, uh, and really uh, heart-wrenching lecture that you'll get from him in, in the discussion. So we've got six more, not five more, uh, until the end of the year. And if you didn't get a chance to sign up on the, uh, the sign-up list right as you exit on your right or left, they're up on the glass wall. We are tracking who's participating if you want to get the cool certificate for participating in about 70 to 80% of these. I'm gonna push it down to probably 70. You'll get a, uh, you'll get a nice, because we want you to come, and there's some new folks in the, uh, in the audience too. Welcome for any of the new students and uh, families that checked in. Anything else, sir, to close on? Please drive safe. It's really cold out. The roads are gonna be slick and icy, and we will see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you.